Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. We'll dismiss our young people to their Sunday school classes. Is God the love of your life today? Amen. If he's not, he should be. Amen. We can turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of First Corinthians, chapter thirteen. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> and we're going to read the entire chapter. First Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also am known, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Amen. Lord, we thank you for being in this house with us today, God. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint our minds, touch our ears to hear your voice today, God. Help us to feel your presence, to feel your love in this house today, God. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint my mind and my thoughts. Touch my tongue today, O oh Lord, as I deliver this message. I ask only to be a vessel for your love today, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'd like to speak to you for just a little while this morning on the topic, when love is enough. When love is enough. <clears throat> the chapter in 1 Corinthians that we just read is known as the love chapter. Right. The word used in this passage is charity. Mm -hmm. But if you take the Greek word that was translated in our Bible to charity, the word is agape. The true translation for agape is love. Mm -hmm. How many here today have experienced love in one form or another? I'm hoping that every one of us can, whether it be love to or from your parents or your children, love to or from another individual, or even love to or from an animal, and even especially the love to and from God. Right. Interesting that they say that a dog is man's best friend. I have two little dogs, and the nice thing about dogs is that when doesn't matter whether you get mad at them, you can yell at them, you can tell them to go and lay down, and when you leave the room and you come back, they're happy to see you. Right. Their tails are wagging, and they, everything that you just said, the fact that you just got mad at them is gone. You can leave them all day long, and there they sit at the door waiting, longing for you to return home, just so they can bestow you with love. It's unconditional, and that's exactly what the love of God 
is. I hope, again, that every one of us here has experienced love in some form, because love is one of man's greatest needs. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you are a person that is full of confidence. It doesn't matter if you're a person who's shy. It doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Everybody on this earth craves to love and be loved, right. to feel love. That's why there are many, many books written about love, talking about how to love somebody else, how to regain love maybe that has been lost. One of the books that I, I believe in, in a marriage relationship, and it, it goes into all kinds of other relationships as well, but I just, it makes sense to me when I, when I read it, is the five love languages. Right. Different ways of expressing love, different ways of feeling loved. And it's, it's an interesting story when Gary Chapman starts off the book, he talks about a couple who got together and they, they lived together, they or they, sorry, they loved each other, they got married, and when they got married, they traveled across the country, so they weren't around friends, they weren't around family, they were starting a new life together. And after they got married, and he was, the husband was starting his career, he was going to school, he was getting things going, and after he got out of school and started his job, things just seemed to fall apart. He was working all the time, he was studying, he was doing what he needed to do to advance his career, and he just kind of felt like his wife didn't love him anymore. But through it all, they came to find out that they were just merely speaking different love languages. His love language was physical touch, her love language was quality time. He needed the connection of touch mm -hmm. to feel loved. And she just wanted to spend time with him. So when they were together before they got married, they were spending time together and they would hug and they would do hold hands. They would get that touch. They would have that connection, both feeling loved. But when it came time and he was going to school and he was studying and he was doing these things, she didn't feel like he loved her, that he loved her anymore because he wasn't spending time with her. And through that, she no longer came into his office when he was studying, no, didn't come up and rub his shoulders, didn't do these things for him. And so he felt unloved by her. They were feeling unloved, even though they both loved one another. And when they came to the realization of what was wrong in their marriage, they both worked to change it. He began to now spend time with her. And in turn, she would walk in when he was doing his work at his office at home and she would come in and she would just rub his shoulders and she would come in and, and give him a kiss and say, hey, I love you. And their love began to flourish and to blossom. But that need was there in both of them right. to feel loved. You see, it's love that can seem to overcome any circumstance. When love is there, you can overcome hurdles. When love is there, you can overcome trials. When love is there, you can overcome any hurdle that will come against you in life. I never truly knew what the depths of a parent's love was until I myself became a parent. It was in that moment, standing in a hospital room, as my wife was giving birth to my daughter, and she came out, they got her taken care of, they put her in the little uh, table, got her all bundled up and everything else, and they came over and they said, do you want to hold her? And myself, I don't think I had ever in my life held a baby, let alone a newborn infant. But the words that came out of my mouth were, yes, I want to hold her. And it was in that moment when they placed her in my arms, that that love for a parent, that need to feel, to know that I'm going to be there to protect her and to teach her and to nurture her and to be with her for whatever she needs through her life suddenly sprang to being. And now I knew what that love was for a parent to a child. That in a moment, in just, it just seems like in that instant of just being able to hold her, that it all changed. And I felt that love. It's that love that allows a parent to love their children even through their mistakes. 
And it's that same love as well from a child to a parent that allows a child to love their parent even through their mistakes. Because love does overcome. I want to take a closer look back into what we just read. Back into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to go to verse number four, but as we look at these, I want to actually replace the word charity with love. First Corinthians 13 and four says, love suffereth long and is kind. What exactly does that mean? It means that love is patient. Mm -hmm. Love allows us to love, to see somebody and allows that person to grow and to learn and it realizes that we are not all the same. Each one of us are individuals. Each one of us are different. In any circumstance that we come into, the Bible tells us that we are to love one another. Now, for the people that are here in this room, I may not love you the way I love my wife. I may not love you the way that I love my child. I may not love you even the way that I love God, but there still needs to be that love and that bond that comes from one human being to another. And it's that love now that allows us to be patient. It's that love now that allows us to look at another individual that may not be who we are, that may not be doing what we're doing, and say, I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to allow you to make mistakes. I'm going to allow you to not be the way I am and still love you just the same. Mm -hmm. Love envieth not. I've been in that situation where others seem to be getting ahead. Others seem to be getting or having or doing more than I'm doing and feel envious of what they have or what they're doing. But true love doesn't do that. Love says, I'm going to rejoice for you when things, when you're blessed. I'm going to rejoice for you when things are going well in your life. I'm going to rejoice for you when you're getting ahead, when you're getting, when you're able to do what it is that you want to do, when your things are working out and it's all in your favor, even though things may not be in my favor, things may not be going right the way I want them to go, things may not be happening the way I want them to happen in my life, but it doesn't give me now a right to now not rejoice with somebody else because they're getting blessed. Love says, I'm going to rejoice with you. Love says, I'm going to hurt with you. Love says, I'm going to be there for you in whatever circumstance you're going through. It doesn't allow for jealousy. It doesn't allow for envy. It goes on to say that love vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. See, love isn't conceited. Our Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter if we're a janitor. It doesn't matter if we're the CEO of a company. It doesn't matter whether we own our own private jet or whether we drive a 1962 rusted oak Volkswagen Beetle or whether all we have are the Nikes on our feet to get where we need to go. Mm -hmm. We don't puff ourselves up in love. One of us is no better than any other of us. It doesn't matter our circumstances. It doesn't matter our stature in, our, in what the world sees and what the world experiences. We are all humans and we're all individuals and love tells us exactly that. The Bible tells us that when the person off the street comes in, we don't set them at the back of the church. We don't push them away, but we bring them to the front and we befriend them and we are with them. It doesn't mean that this person that walks in in a fancy suit that's never been there before, but appears to have lots of money that we lift them up above everybody else. We are to love one another equally. We are to treat each other equally. We are to accept one another for where they're at. And that's what love does. Verse number five says, love doth not behave itself unseemly and seeketh not her own. We're to put others first. So often in our lives, it's easy to get into a place where it's me. It's what do I want? What's gonna be best for my life? I don't have time for that. Or whatever thought comes into our minds, 
But love says, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to put you first and prefer you above myself. Yesterday, I'll be transparent, I, I knew that we had peanut brittle and came down, did peanut brittle yesterday. My daughter's car had an issue in the middle of the night on Friday night. So I had to go rescue her car yesterday afternoon. And I had promised my parents earlier in the week that I would come over on Saturday and help them tear down some kitchen cupboards because their insurance is doing some work in their kitchen and they needed to have the cupboards down so that they could paint before they put the floor down. And so I promised them, I, I said, I'll come over and give you guys a hand. And as my day was progressing yesterday, I'm sitting there thinking I've got a message to finish preparing. And I don't know when I'm going to find the time to do this because I had all these other things that I could have said, no, the car can wait for another day. And I could have said no to my parents. I can't come and, and, and help you today because I've got things I need to do. This isn't about a pat on the back. It's not, that's not what it is that this is looking for, but it's saying that what we do we, is we prefer other people. We can say, I'll get my stuff done when it needs to be done. But when others need a help, when others need a hand, we need to be there for them. And we need to say, I'm going to prefer others above myself, and I'm going to be there because that come, what, come, what goes around comes around. The Bible says that we treat others the way we want to be treated. So there's going to be times in our lives when we need something, when we need help from somebody else. And if we're that one who's being selfish and we're that one who's not out there helping other people, then when we wonder why, when we need a hand, that there's nobody there for us. Because sometimes we need a hand. And if we've been giving and giving and giving and suddenly now the situation arises and we need, that rule comes into play. Because God's word is always true. And the way you treat others is going to treat, is going to come back to you. And suddenly there's going to be the people there that love you that are there to help you. Love is not easily provoked. We stay calm and composed when we feel attacked. We stay calm and composed when people treat us how we don't really want to be treated. We need to realize that we live in the world. Sometimes we get to that place in our lives when we think, well, we're a Christian and we need to treat people a certain way. And when we go out into the world, when we're out, when we're shopping, when we're doing things and people don't treat us the way we think we should be treated, it's easy for us to get our back up. It's easy for us to maybe make a comment that's out of place. It's easy for us to to look at them and think, well, you're being rude, so I might want to be rude back. But love says, what are you going through today? Love says, what are you having to deal with today? Love says, what was the customer like that you had just before me that you're treating me so rude? Maybe they've had a, a run of bad customers and they're just, you happen to be the one that they're now taking their frustration out on. Love would say, hey, you look like you're having a bad day today and offer a word of encouragement. Maybe when we notice that rude customer in line ahead of us, say a few kind words to that, that person. Help them, lift them up. But love isn't easily provoked. Love allows you to stay calm, which leads into the next part, it thinketh no evil. We are rather to think the best of others and situations. Human nature tells us that we are to respond in kind. Human nature would say that we need to get revenge. Human nature would say, well, that person is thinking a certain thing. Maybe somebody is going through something and they're not all smiling like they are normally smiling and they look at you and because they don't have a smile on their face, right away a thought can come into your mind Oh, they're thinking something about me. Oh, maybe they didn't like what I said yesterday. And, and, and our enemy will get into our mind and start playing games in our mind and start bringing thoughts into our mind and turning things into something that isn't meant to be there. Mm -hmm. 
But love thinks no evil. So rather than thinking, because that person's not smiling, maybe there's something wrong with them. I don't mean physically wrong or mentally wrong, but maybe they're going through something today. Hey, you know, you, you appear kind of down today. Um, is everything okay? Love will think the best in every situation mm -hmm. instead of thinking the worst. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. If we're truly walking in love, we, and we have a love for God in our hearts, that's gonna keep us away from the things that we shouldn't be doing. If we have a love for one another, we're gonna do things not Again, now to provoke one another, we're not gonna, we're gonna do things in our lives that are gonna show that love, not to make them think that we don't love. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. This is why when there is love in a marriage, the marriage will stand the test of time and circumstances. When there's love in any relationship between two individuals, nothing, no simple thing is gonna come between that love. Even a love in friendship will stand when love bears all things, when love believes all things, when love hopes all things and endures all things. You see, because when love is enough, life will not be full of turmoil. It's when we allow other things into our lives other than love that our lives start to get tossed and turned upside down. Our life will then become balanced and our life will then contain joy when love is at the forefront of our lives, when love becomes enough for every one of us. You see, when love is enough, all things are possible. When love is enough, you can work through all things mm -hmm. that comes your way. So now here's the real issue with this theory. Our love is flawed. A dog seems to love unconditionally. We know what the word tells us that God loves unconditionally. But we're not a dog. And we're definitely not God. Our love, as much as we try, as much as we put our effort into it, our love does hold conditions because we're people. We can't rely on our love. We can't rely on our understanding. We can't rely on loving through our own power, but we need the love of God working in us. Right. And we need the love of God working through us to one another. First John chapter four and verse number seven, it says, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propiti propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So it's one thing that we can read that scripture. We can know exactly what that scripture says. We can know exactly what that scripture means, that, that if we are professing to know God, and we're professing to have God in us, we're having, professing to have God working through us, that we need to love one another. It's great we can know that. We can read that. We can understand that. But now put that into action. Make that a part of your life. And it's not as easy as just merely reading that or knowing that. I want to read to you this morning an excerpt from Corey Ten Boom's life as she accounted in her book, The Hiding Place. 
Years ago, I listened to the audio drama of, of this story. And this passage that she shares in her book struck me in the fact that we need God in our lives. We need God's love working through us in our lives. It says, it was at a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat. A brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their wraps, and in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so, gl so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? She says, and I stood there. I, whose sins had every day had to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience, since the end of the war, I had, to, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able to also return to the outside world and rebuild their lives. No matter what the physical scars, those who nursed, who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. 
and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's, each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And having thus learned to forgive in this hardest of situations, I never again had difficulty in forgiving. <laughs> I wish I could say that. I wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just naturally flowed from me from then on, but they didn't. If there's one thing I've learned at 80 years of age, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, only draw them fresh from God every day. That's a real life account of one who chose to be a conduit for God's love. You see, it was in that moment when love was enough. It was in that moment, that realization that took part in her heart. Love isn't an emotion. Or love is an emotion, forgiveness isn't an emotion. Forgiveness is an act of will. And in that moment, she realized, she realized that her love was flawed that her love wasn't enough, that her love was not going to change that situation. She knew in that moment that the only love that could heal, the only love that could heal the wounds in her heart, the only wounds that were gonna be enough to forgive this man were this the love that was only going to come from God, that was gonna flow through her. And it was that realization, but by taking his hand, by giving it to God in that moment, that God was allowed now to work and that God could step into her life and into the life of that man and make a difference. And all she had to do was respond to that action. And God did the rest. Because God's love is not flawed. God's love is perfect. God's love is powerful. It's God's love that changes lives. It's God's love, it's God's love that heals our hearts and our wounds that we face and that we pick up in our lifetime. You see, God's love is enough for you and I. John chapter 3 and verse number 16, the verse that the world even knows so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, our love has conditions. Our love says, if you treat me right, if you act right towards me, if you do things for me, if you, if you meet these conditions, I will love you. But God doesn't put those conditions on us. God doesn't impose those conditions upon our life for us to receive his love, to, for us to receive his forgiveness, for us to receive the thing that we need the most in life that nourishing love. He does no condition to put upon it because while we were yet sinners, he died for us, showing us his love, showing us that he cared enough for us that he would robe himself in flesh and die for every one of us. All of the traits that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 are all embodied in Christ and what he did for you and I. We can go back and read where it says that charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That is Jesus. 
as he looks into every one of our hearts, as he looks into every one of our lives, that's how he looks at us. With love. He has the love of a father like we have for our children, but greater love does he have for us. There's nothing that we can do that we can escape his love. There's nothing that we can do that's going to stop him from loving us. He may not like the sin that we allow into our lives, but he still loves us as individuals. He still cares for us. He still reaches for us. He still died on a cross for us in the midst of our sin. And all he wants for us is to get to that place where we love him, where the silver and the gold and the things of this world are not enough. But love would overcome those things. Love for Jesus would be enough for us to live our lives for him. You see, when we break down the fact that Jesus came to save us from our sin, God manifesting himself in flesh to be that sacrifice for, all, for our sins, it was all done in love. You see, there's two emotions. There's love and there's anger. You really can't have anger if you don't have love. You read back through, through the, the Bible and you read the places where in, Mo, in Noah's day when God repented of making man. The Bible says he repented. He wished he hadn't made man it was because he loved mankind so much. And he looked at what mankind was doing and how mankind was acting. And it made him upset because of what man was doing. And that's because he loved us enough. When he looks down and he sees us and he sees our actions and he sees what we're doing that is against him. I can just imagine God in his love going, what are you doing, child? What are you doing right now? We don't want to be the ones that are that are re-nailing those those spikes into his hands through our sins. We don't want to be the ones that are plating that crown of thorns back onto his head through our actions and through our, our words to others. We don't want to be the one that is whipping him and beating him when we, the way we treat others in this world, but we should be in love and we should be acting in love and we should be allowing that love to flow from our lives one to another and up to him. We should be allowing that love to direct our thoughts, to direct our minds and to receive the love that he has for us. You see, it was love that led Jesus to the woman at the well. It was love that Je it's because of love that Jesus did not condemn the woman caught in the very act of adultery. It was because of love that Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home and said, I'm coming to your house today. Mm -hmm. Every one of these individuals were flawed. And I'm here today to tell you that every one of us are flawed. but it's God's love that can be found in this place. It's God's love that can be found right here, right now. As we stand together this morning, I'm gonna invite Sister Wilson to come. We're called to love one another. We're called to forgive one another. Many of us have been going through the journey of our Connect program. Hurts, habits, and hangups. We've all got them. We can deny it. We can try to push them aside. We can try to hide them from those around us, but they're all there. Through the entire program, the biggest thing that we can, that works through that program is God's love. I know what it's like, not in an exact situation, but to be Corey Tenbo, standing in front of somebody 
that's done something to you and you have to forgive them. And knowing how hard that can be. The realization that God forgave us. That he loved us enough. And the realization that God can give that love, we just put it into action. See, it's God's love that can bring healing and make you what he wants you to be. And it's God's love that is reaching for you today. Today you are the woman at the well. Today you are the, the one that was brought to Jesus by the accusers. And today you are the one who Jesus is saying, I want to come to your house today. I want to open this altar. And I urge you today to step out of your comfort zone. I urge you today to imagine If you will, there's a cross at the, front, at the front of this church. And I urge you to come to that cross and say, Jesus, I need your love. I need to experience your love. I need to have your love working in me. I need to have your love working through me. God, make me who you want me to be. I urge you to open your heart let Jesus in and let him do what he wants in your life today. Again, this altar is open. Thank you, Jesus.